Want to get started opening a Chinese company? Today, we're going to try our best to shed some light on the various corporate structures Westerners have for opening a company here in China. And thanks for tuning in. It's Global from Asia, episode number 70. Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business from Hong Kong is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now, your host, Michael Michelini. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today and being here with me. I've been getting more and more requests about mainland China business, and I'm excited for this week's show. But first, some news and updates. I was interviewed by Ali Mona of Limitless Laowai Podcast. She's up in Shanghai. She's been cranking out shows like crazy, helping entrepreneurs and expats in China to hear from others and learn and get ideas. I shared on her show about my China tech startup and social media experience and the tough, tough times and the ups and downs that I went through. If you're curious, you can check it out on limitlesslawai.com slash Mike Michelini. I'm also going to link it on the show notes here and you can hear me spill my guts about my experiences. Also, my friend at shenzhenparty.com just released a book titled Shenzhen, the book. Pretty uh, pretty awesome name, right? And uh, they're letting me give you guys a first chapter for free. So if you want to head over to the show notes for today's episode at globalfromasia.com slash episode 70, I'm happy that we're going to have this chance to to give you guys a little preview of the ultimate guide about Shenzhen, China. It's going to be on the market and I'm glad it's there. So now on to the show. I'm meeting more and more people coming into China for the first time to open their businesses and they're always so full of energy and excitement but have lots and lots of questions and can easily make some mistakes and get on the wrong track. So the rules have actually gotten easier here in China. So we have Jason Zhou from Beijing Baire Law Firm to discuss the different choices businesses and entrepreneurs have when opening up the company in China. I know it's going to be a top podcast listened for a long time, and we're not going to hold anything back. Also, after the show, I'm going to go through some of my personal experiences with companies in China that I've set up and how it's changed since I started. So stick till the end, and I'm also going to read a five-star review we got. I'm excited about that, so stay tuned after the interview. But let's jump in. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to another Global from Asia podcast. We are here in Shenzhen, China, with Jason Zhou in his law firm now. So thanks for being here, Jason. Hello, everyone. Okay. Yeah. My name is uh, Jason Zhou. I'm a lawyer based in Shenzhen. Our topic today is about how foreign investors should establish their business presence in China. We know that China has been developing very rapidly in the recent 30 years. And every year it is attracting a large amount of foreign investors. But when investors establish the business presence in China, they should choose the most appropriate for them. So this is what we are going to discuss today. Yeah, I mean, we were talking before we started recording. And of course, it's, you know, it's going to be impossible to cover all this knowledge and experience in, in one episode. But we're going to kind of go through the different choices and options that foreigners or non non Chinese have uh, also you know think we met at a wine and cheese event so it's a great organization Shenzhen party and Brent connected us Brent Everman so just wanted to give him a quick shout out I I think he's listening too so thanks again Brent for connecting us so I think first you know I think I have some questions here but before I even start is I still hear foreigners or I guess we'll call foreigners just so everyone's listening is non Chinese they think they can't even own a company in China, but it is possible, right? They, they, you don't have to have a Chinese partner if if you are not ready or don't don't need it. So you know that's definitely just for the record, it's possible for foreigners to own and do business in China. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, well, actually, when we talk about uh, foreign investors, we actually mean uh, foreign capital because this is also for investors in Hong Kong, Taiwan. And uh, so we will refer all of them to as uh, foreign investors uh, that the capital is from uh, overseas of uh, mainland China. So uh, there are typically four kind of business presences for foreign investors in China. Uh, the first one is uh, Wolfie, uh, which is a wholly foreign owned enterprise. Also, we have the Sino Foreign Joint Venture. And uh, we will refer to as JV. Also, there is a representative office of a foreign company, as well as foreign invested 
partnership enterprise, and this is a, a very new form of business presence in China. So, um, yeah, can we yeah, I think maybe also I just like want to actually re clarify: uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, and Taiwan is foreign. So some people actually ask. Me, I, I also kind yeah, of go through some um, questions people ask me. So just actually, to say the foreign investment is uh, is about foreign capital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which means the capital that is not generated in China, that yeah. is uh, from our uh, overseas of mainland China. So we will usually say about foreign investors. Foreign so investors. that will include the investors from our uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Clear, clear. And it could also be a mainland Chinese person that has a Hong Kong company that then. Yeah, yeah. So for for mainland Chinese individual that has a company in Hong Kong, he can use this Hong Kong company to invest back into China again mm-hmm. as a foreign investment. Okay, sure. So, yeah, I, I, of course, I'm glad, I'm excited to jump right in, but maybe a little bit more before we get in. How, how long have these different structures been in existence, you know, in China? I know, like you said, 30 years is so small amount of time. So yeah. when did these start to come into play about maybe, are they... Is it, I mean, I guess a lot of times people wonder when do the rules change and <laughs> are uh, any ideas of, can you share some perspective yeah, of the development over time? This right? uh, business presence is, has been uh, in existence for a very long time. It's uh, only the FIPE, which is a foreign investment partnership enterprise. It's a very new form, mm. yeah, which allows Chinese individuals to form an enterprise with the foreign capitals because in the past only Chinese business entities can form a JV mm. with foreign capitals. Okay. So today I I will also share some knowledge about the differences of all the business presences in yeah, China. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I'm wondering which one to start with. What do you what do you uh, I would like to talk about Wolfie first. Okay, because sure. uh Wolfie I think is the most uh normal practice for foreign investors. A Wolfie is uh, short for wholly foreign owned enterprise, which means all the capital is from overseas. It can be one shareholder or it can be several shareholders, but all of them should be foreign capitals. Yeah, Wolfie is a um, company with uh, limited liability. As same as other companies with limited liabilities that are invested by Chinese domestic investors, Wolfie is, a, is an independent legal person who has its own property and can be independently responsible for the debts it has. The shareholders of the Wolfie is only liable for the debts of the Wolfie extends to the registered capital it subscribes. And so this is most usual practice because most of the foreign companies, they, will, they would not like to bear the responsibilities of the subsidiaries in China. So the subsidiaries can handle their own debts and their own legal matters. So subsidiary would be underneath a separate company. So there's Wolfie and then a subsidiary, or is uh, it? I mean, there is Wolfie as Wolfie the subsidiary is, of is, the overseas is company. The subsidiary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This uh, one can be uh, independently responsible for the debts, yeah. which will not affect the the liabilities of the mother company. Okay. Clear. Yeah. So and as an independent legal person, it has all the rights as a company in China. For example, it can conduct substantial, all kind of substantial business uh, scopes, uh, except for those are restricted or prohibited for foreign capitals. Yes, it has its own rights to employ their employees and sign labor contracts with them and uh, receive business incomes and issue invoices, fa piao. Yeah, fa piao. Yeah. So, Wolfie is the uh, most usual practice and uh, their minimum registered capital is not a requirement anymore. So that makes it much more easier for foreign investors to open a Wolfie here. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a woofy now, and I, I did it a long time ago. So I, I had to do registered capital in 2008 when I registered was a hundred thousand RMB. So now I, I'm also learning about this. So this is a new change, I think. And yeah. maybe we can first talk. Yeah, let's maybe talk. When did I'm curious? When did that change? Because I know a lot of foreigners have companies now, and they've they've done that. When did that? change or the process of the registered capital? The registered capital because uh, yeah, China is uh, making reforms on the business registration issues and is encouraging free market. Yeah. This is changed since March 1st, 2014 okay, really. when the amended company law mm-hmm. took effective. And actually, it has been uh, for a trial for around one year in Shenzhen before March the 1st of 2014. So in Shenzhen, we already have this policy since March the 1st, 2013. Yeah. And uh, according to the new policies, there is no requirement on the minimum registering capital. And the shareholders also can arrange their injections of the capitals according to their own plans instead of uh, having to inject the capitals in required time period. Got it. Yeah, I remember when I, I did the 100,000, which is the lowest amount possible. For, yeah, and lowest it, amount. it depended also on what type of business you did then. So yeah. like I did it yeah. import yeah. and export consulting company. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very big change because in the past, the minimum registered capital is uh, quite different for different kind of a business, such as a manufacturing business. It requires at least 500,000 RMB. Yeah, as a, Importing, they asked me for 300. Yeah, for wholesales, for retails, uh, they have different requirements. So now it's... Now it's... Any, uh, any yeah, because like I said, they are encouraging great, the, great. The, the market. Yeah. For anyone that did it before, there's no... It still stays the same for them, right? I, I yeah. Maybe some listeners haven't finished their capital investment. Maybe they're halfway. They still need to finish what they started, right? Like. Yeah, they still have to finish what they have started. Yeah. Okay, and and then maybe we can talk about some res- restricted industries, or how do I know? I would. Uh, like yeah, restricted areas. Or? So this is actually our. Uh, I would like to talk in about in the uh, JV. Okay, okay, sure. Yeah, we, because yeah. uh, in the JV, it allows foreign capital to to involve in some of the restricted areas. Yeah, especially those are restricted for wolfies, mm. for pure foreign capital. Yeah, a JV are, is a. Also, a company with limited liability, but that is uh, co-established by foreign investors. So it means joint joint venture, just yeah, joint venture, yeah, yeah, joint venture, yeah, and Chinese domestic business entities. You know that in the JV joint venture, the Chinese side can only be a business entity; it cannot be a an individual individual investor. Yeah. The establishment process of a for, sign of foreign joint venture is almost the same as the WOFI, which first needs the approval from the government bureau, which is uh, the authority for the foreign investment. Yeah. And the JV is uh, established for the purposes for the uh, foreign capitals to enter into some of the restricted areas that a wolfy can't. Mm. Yeah. Like, a, I like, think like uh, a, bank, a bank is one I think. Yeah, of. bank. <laughs> uh, also such as gas exploration, okay. market survey, higher education, entertainment venue. Yeah, entertainment uh, business places. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think what there were, would, what's an example of entertainment. Yeah, entertainment. Like KTV? Or? Yeah, KTV, yeah, is a typical entertainment okay. place, but it, restaurant is not an entertainment. Okay, it's okay. Uh, just a normal food service, yeah. This is uh, very strange because in most of the other countries, uh, I think there are also restricted areas for foreign capitals, but 
they might not be so wide as in China. I think uh, there might be some of the causes um, that that first of all, maybe the China government wants to protect the local capitals in certain areas, or politically, yeah. <laughs> sometimes some of the areas are very sensitive. Right. Now, in nowadays, for foreign capital, sure. such as um, uh, publications, yeah, media, yeah, media publications, they are still restricted for foreign capital. Yeah, yeah. but with a JV, you are able to enter into a lot of different business areas that are restricted for wolfies. Um, we have a catalog for the guidance of uh, foreign investment industries. This guidance shows all the areas that are encouraged, restricted, and prohibited for foreign capitals. Yeah. Okay. So, is that in English? Yeah, or? everyone. Yeah, we have an English version. Okay. Uh, yeah, so That's everyone can refer to that guidebook. Is that on uh, digital or paper or? Uh, um, digital. Oh, great. Yeah, Maybe digital. we could include a link yeah. to it and yeah. to show. Yeah. Notes. Okay. Yeah. Great. So we that was that's JV Joint Venture, yeah. and, and uh, there is uh, the representative office. I have one maybe question about a JV. Okay, how many shares does uh, each partner have to have? Like the local Chinese partner, is it fifty fifty or or? Yeah, for for most of the uh, business areas, they we don't have the uh, limitations about the shares. Yeah, but for some of the business areas, we require that the Chinese capital to be the major shareholders. Major Yeah, the major so shareholders. Can maybe, I think I learn best by examples. For example, uh, to open a cinema. Okay. Yeah, the Chinese side should have the major part. Yeah. Major being 51? 51, yeah. Okay. And then, so there could be other types of businesses where... The part the Chinese partner is yeah, 10, yeah. 15 yeah, percent. Yeah, it's possible for uh, them to have less shares. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for some of the uh, some of the business areas that are not so sensitive. Okay. Yeah. Sure, it's good. I mean, I know we can't go into so much detail on a short, such a short show, but um, also my about the invested capital. Would both sides match the amount of sh- amount he invested? So, it says a million. RMB capital that the partners want to put in. I guess it could be it doesn't have to match the shares, right? Or does it? Yeah, uh, it does not have to mm, match the shares. But actually, actually, the the property invested will match the shares. But you can you can have a uh, different rates for the uh, for bearing the debts or getting the profits according to your own agreements. Yeah. Okay, clear, clear. Great. So then my for my, my recap so far, we talked about Woofie and JV. So yeah. Woofie is 100% foreign investment. Yeah, JV, JV would have at least some Chinese local investment. Yeah. And the reason to maybe do that is for certain restricted industries yeah. to local, do a JV. Local protections, yeah. Okay. And then... Um, um, Representative office is uh, the second normal practice for foreign investors than Wolfie. Yeah, it's uh, it's just an alliance, an office of an overseas company or business entity in China, and uh, it is set up for the main purposes of uh, market development or supplier management in mainland China. Rep office does not have the qualification to, to as an independent legal person. Yeah, it does not have its independent property, and uh, it cannot be independently responsible for the debts it has in China. Which means the uh, company who set up this RO will be responsible, uh, will be wholly responsible for all the responsibilities, for all the obligations 
of the rep office in China. Okay, so like say it's a U.S. company opens a RO, and then they're they're liable for the debt. Yeah. So it goes yeah. back. It's not like limiting the liability in China. Yeah. It goes so to the parent. So when the RO has to pay for some of the uh, debts, or uh, or uh, for example the administrative penalties, the U.S. company will be solely responsible for that. I've heard a lot of my friend. I never had an RO, so I went directly to Wolfie. But I, like, like you said, it's it's so you can't sell in China, you can't right? Sell in China with your RO, you can. Or I don't, you, you can't. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You can't issue the fa piao, which yeah, is like the uh, receipt. Yes. So RO is uh, not allowed to involve in any substantial businesses yeah. in China and. The most important of all is that it does not have the uh, legal qualification to hire the employees by themselves. It has to hire the employees via stipulated human resource companies. Yeah, so that makes a lot more expenses for them. Yeah, uh, even though it is not an independent business entity, which means it does not generate revenues by itself. Uh, it still has the uh, related taxes in China. Yeah. So uh, it has the business tax and also the enterprise income tax. These taxes are not based on the uh, revenues it generates, but based on the costs. Yeah, the the daily cost. Got it. And I've heard my friends that have these complain about that because you pay a tax on how much you spend, not how much you earn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is uh, very interesting because the China government is uh, is trying to calculate the avenues, revenues that made by the mother company, uh, depending on the cost of the uh, representative office. They think that if you spend more here, you must have been generating more avenues, more revenues from China too. Interesting. Yeah. So just to maybe recap um, my sides, there the main difference here is. You can't it's much more restricted to have an RO, which is a rep office, registra- representative office or RO is the same. Is uh you can't hire directly if you can have people work in your office, but their their contract is with the with gov- other companies, another There's, HR company. Yes, stipulated human resource companies. So you'd have to pay an HR company to pay the salary. Yeah, you have to pay for the salary, pay for the social insurance, and uh, beyond that you have to pay for the service fees. Uh, for the human resource companies, they are, they have a name as uh, FASCO. Okay. Yeah, Foreign Enterprise uh, Service Company, like that. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah. So, I think mostly people do this because they don't want to invest in the woofy. But now that there's no, because there was no registered capital for a yes, rep office, yeah. but there's now no rep. Register capital for a woofy. Yeah. Do people still even open ROs? Or yeah, RO is uh, easier to be liquidated, mm. yeah, than a woofy. Uh, also, it does not have to be approved by the uh, by the authorities that that to approve the foreign investment. So it's easier to set up a woofy here in China, but it has some some conditions about the mother company that the mother company has been in existence for at least two years and has a very stable business address and uh, Wolfie does not have that conditions so based on the con- based on their actual situations it might be even easier for you to to establish a Wolfie in China great great this is really great okay I'm going to move is there any other points when we move to the next? Uh, foreign investment partnership enterprise, and this is a this is a very new type of uh, because ent- partnership enterprise is previously only available for Chinese. Yeah, two Chinese people can form a partnership enterprise. They share the profits and they bear bear the debts according to the uh, partnership agreement uh, that they both executed. Yeah. So this is open to foreign individuals. Uh, so in this business presence, it allows foreign investors to form a 
partnership enterprise with uh, either Chinese business entity or a Chinese individual. This is usually existed in restaurants, consultation companies, uh, which is uh, based on the techniques of the foreigners. For example, if you have a very good talent in uh, opening restaurant or opening a uh, design company in designs, you can uh, open a foreign investment partnership enterprise with uh, Chinese business entities or individuals because it allows you to use your technologies or use your talents to invest in the enterprise. Yeah. And uh, a partnership enterprise is uh, also not a legal person. Yeah. The, it does not have the enterprise income tax. So the partners of the uh, enterprise will be personally responsible for the uh, profits they get from the partnership enterprise. Yeah. And uh, also there are typically two kind of uh, partnership enterprises in China. One is a general partnership enterprise and one is a limited partnership enterprise. For a general partnership enterprise, all of the partners are general partners, which means uh, all the partners are responsible, will have a joint and severe responsibility for wholly responsible for the that's the partnership enterprise. And in a limited partnership enterprise, there are general partners as well as uh, limited partners. The limited partners will only be responsible for the debts of the partnership enterprise extend to the capitals they subscribe. Yeah. Also, there is no minimum capital requirement for partnership enterprise yeah so to me it sounds similar like in in at least in the u.s there's general partnerships general partnerships uh, or uh, llps limited liability partnerships yeah so usually like i think it's like like it's a service like law firms consultants yeah like these kind of specialists usually set these up honestly i'm not at least in the u.s i'm not sure why this different than op just opening a company but maybe because of tax taxes you can just have the money flow directly to the individual rather yeah, than yeah. have an enterprise yeah. tax yeah, because there is no enterprise uh, income tax okay. for for such uh, for such business presence okay. yeah. yeah this is really great i did have on my list i don't know if we want to talk about it but vie which maybe isn't even really legal no, vie is a uh, I, I know that it's a legal firm in the uh, United States that the accounting books can be combined together for a company and it's a VIE subsidiary. Mm. Yeah, but in China, this is, a, this is something that is not completely according to the law because uh, we only admit those shareholder controls. Right. Yeah. yeah, we because the contract is something that can be uh, violated. Yeah. Yeah. So VIE is a uh, is a usual practice in the U.S. I think that it is uh, usually used for the foreign capitals to enter into some of the businesses that are completely restricted for foreign capitals. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. we don't go so deep, but basically, yeah, basically, what I understand is this: like you said, like a restricted. I usually think an internet company in China, yeah. like uh, foreigners can't can't yeah. own an internet also like company. Uh, telecommunication value added services mm -hmm. that are completely restricted for uh, foreign capitals. Yeah. So if you want to invest in this field, you probably have to find some Chinese to establish the company, yeah. and then you can control the company via some VIE structures. Which is not legal in China. Yeah, it it's, uh, in it's not, it's, um, not it's, recognized, maybe. Yeah, it's not normal practice in China, but okay. in the U.S., uh, they will deem this VIE-controlled China company as your subsidiary and their revenues as yours. Uh, but in China, this is just an agreement. 
Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Let's, so basically, uh, let's just stop at that because it's, it's a little bit complicated and not, not common. So we're talking. I have a few more questions. Where it's been amazing already. Uh, interviews. So thanks so much for sharing. Maybe we talked about some of the restricted industries, um, and we talked about reasons why maybe these don't don't are restricted in, in yeah, China. We are we are gradually open to the world, but we are not that open right now. Yeah, so this is slowly slowly opening. Yes, yeah, slowly opening. So I think our second section was to talk about some. We're entering 2015, a new year, both、uh, Western New Year and Chinese New Year. Is come is coming when we're recording, and what are some tips? Maybe we can give some expats or foreigners in China for, for the new year. Yeah, in the new year, I think、um, legal tips. <laughs> <laughs>、yeah. I know that there are a lot of more opportunities in China, including the career opportunities or business opportunities. About、uh, the legal tips, the latest two laws that are effective. I think、uh, will most、uh, affect experts' life. I think one is the、uh, exit and entry administration law that was、uh, amended to be if effective since July the first, two thousand thirteen. Okay. Yeah.、Uh, uh, this is、uh, this is the major law. I think an expert should know about. Yeah, because it has a lot of、uh, amendments, and、uh, especially more strict, strict about the visa and about the residence issues. Yeah, and the second is that in the past the foreign employees are not、uh, forced to attend into the social insurance programs in China, but. The government now require all the companies established in China when they hire foreign employees, they have to attend the social insurance programs for them.、Okay. Yeah, this is、uh, another one big change.、Okay. Yeah. So, what was that? Can we maybe re- go through the first one again? What was the f- first? The accident and entry exit administration law. Accident,、yeah. exit and entry administration, administration law. law. So、yeah. what? It's about like coming in and out of yeah, China. Coming in and out of China because the visa types has been changed. Also, the the compensations for breaking these rules has been raised <laughs>、oh, no. a lot. Okay. So, I mean, like overstay, staying, overstaying, yeah, like overstaying. In the past, you may be fined one thousand RMB for overstaying, and they still will give you the visa next time. But nowadays, they They may fine you uh, like ten、uh, thousand. Wow! Yeah, and、uh, you may be、uh, restricted to apply for a visa anymore. Wow! Yeah,、okay. so it's、um, more strict than ever. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a.、Uh, I've had friends that have overstayed <laughs> before that law. I mean, I haven't known anybody lately, but they would pay per day that they overstayed a fee, and but they would get their passport back, and they would be able to get new visas. So now it's it's more. Uh, more of a problem than before. Okay.、Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Jason, for coming on、yeah. the show. It was really amazing. I'm sure listeners got a lot of, of knowledge and are some interested to contact you. Maybe you can share more about you and your services. I'm、uh, based in Shenzhen. Our law firm is、uh, called Beijing Barry Law Firm Shenzhen, and、uh, I'm personally I'm specialized in company law, foreign investment. Uh, comprehensive corporate legal services and、uh, projects like、uh, liquidation, merger and, and acquisition, and、uh, franchising, yeah, or business matters. Also, our our lawyers are specialized in different areas,、uh, including intellectual property,、uh, real estate, labor law,、uh, family law, etc. Um, we have、uh, I have established a team of English-speaking lawyers that can help the、uh, experts in China in、uh, their personal and business、uh, issues. And、uh, also, I work for a 
company called Shenzhen Commerce. Actually, it's a it's a business cooperation because they are helping the foreign investors to establish their business presences, like Bofi in China. Okay. Um, I. I'm, I am retained as their chief legal advisor. My team will help them to review all the legal documents, and they have their own people to to handle the formalities in the different authorities in different cities. Uh, so this, I think, assures the uh, quality of the services too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because uh, you know that there were many. <laughs> There are mainly two kind of uh, companies or firms that do this kind of service. One is uh, some of the agents, and the other is uh, law firms like us. Yeah, but this provides an opportunity for for the clients to have equal services as a law firm, but enjoy much lower rates. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, cause basically, like an agency usually is lower priced, but they they might. Not know the legal yeah, as well. They sometimes they prepare for the documents so very carelessly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Of course, there's a lot of entrepreneurs listening that every dollar they they're watching closely. <laughs> but I think with law, right, especially in China, if you make, you can cost you a lot more money later if yeah, you make a yeah. mistake. Actually, uh, we are we uh, our law firm is cooperate with Shenzhen Commerce because we think we can help a lot of our foreign investors to to legally and more efficiently operate their business in China. Uh, we not only help them to establish their business, we also help them in their legal consultations and the. Uh, Consultation on the accounting, audit, uh, taxation, uh, trademark registration or patent registration, a lot of uh, related areas. Yeah, uh, in a word, to help them to to grow in China. Great, yeah. great. So we'll link up those websites on the on the show notes and and uh, and any other contact information you want to share. Okay. Uh, I can uh, leave my personal information and the contact information of SenzhenCommerce.com. Also, I have uh, established a new WeChat account. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the name of the WeChat account is uh, SZ Legal Two O One Five. Yeah, this this WeChat number is established to to help the experts in China to provide them with the uh, free initial legal consultations. Yeah, I hope this can help them. Yeah. Great, thanks. And also, I, I forgot to ask, but some people like are in Shanghai or Beijing, is the law the same or is the policy the same or opening? Uh, the policies are, um, the registration, business registration policies nowadays are the same because it has been trialed in Shenzhen for one year. Okay. Yeah, Shenzhen is uh, always the uh, forerunner. Right. Yeah, of China, and uh, it's the special economic zone. And uh, when China has some uh, some some policies that are very active, they they intend to to have its trial in Shenzhen first before it is uh, put into whole China. Yeah, they are the same, and uh, I can uh, also provide the legal consultations to the experts from all over China. Okay, yeah. great, great to know because I know we have listeners all over China. So <laughs> thanks again, Jason. Thanks so much and uh, have a great day. Great. Thanks, thanks Michael. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, for sharing so openly. And please, everybody, take time to shoot him a thank you note for coming on to the show. He was still figuring out what is a podcast. He hadn't heard of that before, and I explained it to him as an online radio. And it was really unfortunate is that this podcast is blocked inside of mainland China, so he couldn't even listen to other shows to get an idea of how the show would go. But I think he did a great job, and I think it would be awesome if he got a whole bunch of thank you messages from you guys for uh, being on a show. He'd be so ecstatic and probably wouldn't know where it came from. So I said at the beginning I would share some of my experiences with Chinese company setup. So I did set up my own Woofie in 2008. Uh, it was a wholly foreign owned entity. It cost me quite a bit of money then. And I was always thinking I was doing it early and it would maybe be 
more expensive now, but it seems like the opposite. You can never predict what happens here in China, right? So I did the smallest capital investment re- company, 100,000 RMB, which is about 15,000 US dollars now. And it was $13,000 then due to currency exchange changes. And it was a consulting and import export company. It's still here today. It's called Shadstone Import and Export Shenzhen Company Limited. You notice you have to have the the function of import export and Shenzhen where the city is. Uh, it's a requirement in a naming for Chinese companies. And uh, like I said, it's still in operations. I use it here to get my work permit and do some consulting projects and and uh, be legal in China. And also, just to note, it's fully owned by my Hong Kong company, Shadstone Limited. Like I've said in other shows, it was uh, I originally was going to come here and open up the Chinese Woofie as an American. I had no idea what I was doing when I came from the U.S. to China, and I didn't. I thought Hong Kong was just like a middleman company country you know, place and I thought it would, you know but my lawyer who I paid a lot of uh, fees to did help me out and did uh, advise me correctly to open up this Hong Kong company that would then own the Woofy here in China and it helps me a lot when ownerships changes and other changes it all happens up in the Hong Kong structure and the Hong Kong company or limited completely owns the Ch- Chinese Woofy so there's not a lot of paperwork to do in China also some other advice is Friends I've known have kind of saved money or thought it would be easier just to open a rep office, a RO, instead of a woofy. But uh, a few of them have uh, gone back and changed their, you know, company from a rep office to a woofy because it was a lot more hassle. Uh, luckily, I never bothered with a rep office. I just went straight to woofy because it seems like you don't hire the workers directly. You have to pay this government office, labor like office, and then they pay the workers for you. And then you got to pay a fee for that. Plus, you have to pay tax on the cost of your China operations, not on the income. So it just really seems limiting and so- sucks to be honest. So maybe I'm wrong. I, you know, I don't like to like be so firm, but uh, I haven't heard people that have had uh, good experiences and recommend opening rep offices. And now our five star review. I'm really happy we're getting these on a regular basis. It's from a. Uh, Chi in Hong Kong, he's uh, been a longtime listener and a great supporter of the show and, and everything. And I'm glad he came through and, and took time to leave a review. So let's read it out loud. Must listen to for anyone want to do business in Hong Kong. What an insightful podcast on everything on running a business in Hong Kong. I was worried if I was getting ripped off from my company auditing. Listening to the show gave me a much better idea of what cost what. Thanks, Global from Asia. Oh, thank you, Chief. Uh, really appreciate it, buddy. And that's all we have today, folks. Thanks again for tuning in. I feel like I was blah, blah, blahing a little bit longer on this intro and a recap. But I think I kept it action-packed and valuable. Again, feedback, five-star reviews, any kind of suggestions for episodes, always appreciated. And uh, we got lots in the queue. So see you next week. Bye-bye. To get more info about running an international business via Hong Kong, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.